welcome to the How I Rehab podcast brought to you by the Sports Back Network. We have recently had a bit of a rebrand of the podcast. Uh, the emphasis will remain on talking around you know, injury practices and management in rehabilitation, uh, sports physio, and, and chatting through some case scenarios or case studies, and, and as well as hearing from some of the top practitioners from around the world who might be working in sport or working with the athletic population, I guess. Uh, here at the Sports Map, we're just really eager to continue to, I guess, provide a platform for furthering um, the way we as practitioners can and play our role and enhance things for our clients and athletes. And if we can play a small role in that, in, in keeping people you know, motivated to learn more, um, being in touch with the latest practices and evidence and, and implementation of clinical reasoning. So I think that's what we're all about. And hopefully we continue to bring uh, some of that great content forward to you guys. And that kicks off a little bit today, talking to Emilio Pacheca, who is the performance and rehabilitation uh, manager at the New England Patriots in the NFL. And prior to that, Emilio was the head physio for Carton Football Club and also Western United in rugby here in Australia. So a really nice mix of sports. Uh, before we jump in and maybe introduce Emilio more and, and talk through some elements of our chat, which which includes, I guess, how to work in the NFL and the process to getting over there to work in the States, as well as some sort of metrics around Achilles tendon loading uh, for those athletes and, and also some of the troubles there is in uh, working in the NFL with access to players and um, how the off-season works and things like that, which is really prime time, I guess, for Achilles pathology or tendon pathology. Um, but before we do, as I said, we've had a huge a uh, couple of months here at the Sports Map with some live events, starting with you know Jonas Dododo on speed and acceleration and Tim McGrath. That was last November for a two-day course with Tim and a one-day course with Jonas, um, both fantastic sort of, and highly practical workshops. Recently, we had Ben Ashworth do his athletic shoulder. Uh, he ran a couple of courses, one in Melbourne and one in Sydney. We also had Craig Purdom and Michael Giacumis uh, team up for Mastering Muscles. I was held at the Sydney Swans venue uh, in the in Sydney, which was a tremendous uh, location to run a course. And we topped that off with the uh, How I Rehab Conference, with it, which was a sold-out event spanning uh, 12 presenters over two days with plenty of practical work and clinical take-homes uh, still available for virtual access is that course. But um, really appreciative of, obviously, you know, the turnout and the, the support we had for that course. And we look forward to bringing another larger scale conference together in 2025. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. Uh, and obviously now we'll be pushing on with our online masterclass subscription um, process for all your CPD needs. Uh, now, those that don't know, these videos are, you know, they're relatively punchy, they're 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, that delivered a new one every single month. And if you're a member or subscriber, you get access to the full content of material there. So that's up to now 30 plus hours of, you know, really great insights with some of the, the world's best practitioners from Edna King to Jordan Menaguchi, Craig Purdom to Jill Cook, the list goes on. Um, and members also get great discounts to our virtual courses and our online courses, as well as, you know, uh, they get free access to one of our upcoming events. And, and that is, um, called the Problematic Plantar Fascia, and that's an online event. It'll go for 90 minutes, more of a round table with Henrik Real, who's who's been a you know a cornerstone of all the research around plantar fascia, Athel Thompson, who's a well-known podiatrist, who's recently uh, been working at Aspatar Sports Med Center, and Roman Turillion, who's a, a, fr a French uh, physio, who completed his PhD on foot strength. So bring all, all that together, we hope to really talk around some plantar fascia management, as well as sort of what we do post-ruptures or post-surgical release. So. Um, really engaging. It's only $29 for those that aren't members, but if you are a member, it, it is free and there's always extra benefits in there for um, in members. So I guess um, keep your eyes peeled for some content that's coming forward. We've got the likes of Ben Ashworth just got released. Uh, Tim McGraw on PCL is coming soon. Shane Kelly from Royal Ballet in London to Claire Robinson on Patella. Seth O'Neill on the Achilles and, and Colin Griffin on sort of end-stage Achilles tendinopathies for more of the performance athletes and Neil Welsh from the Sports Surgery Clinic on lower back pain and Mike Lancaster on calf injuries, who's a head physio at Harlequins Rugby. Eamon Delahunt, um, who's well-known research, comes out of Dublin University on chronic ankle instability. So we've got a range of fantastic learning opportunities coming. Um, so I guess, uh, as mentioned, it's only $30 a month and you get access to all that. So that, for instance, is, well, it's half of a weekend course for all your CPD needs throughout the full year. Um, so we're really, as, as, and where that comes from is, 
is that designed to provide great education that actually is clinically, clinically applicable so you guys can use it in your practice day one after watching this content. So a seven-day trial, feel free to check it out uh, and get in touch with any questions or feedback. All right, so as mentioned, thankful to have Emilio on today. Now, Emilio, I actually know Emilio from uh, back in the early days of my physio career. He was a, he was a physio for me in my uh, years of first uh, year of playing football over there in Perth, and then I ended up working at his clinic. I like to tell him that I turned it around from a, from a struggling local practice to a thriving one. Um, I don't know if he'll agree, but uh, from there, had a really great relationship. Where we've always shared lots of uh, information and content. So. Uh, between each other and, and sports and difficult cases. So uh, it'd be good. it's finally good to get him on here. He's always, uh, you know, pushed, pushed the boundaries with um, challenging me on a few things. So it's nice to have him here and we'll poke a few questions his way. All right. Well, thanks for tuning into the, the How I Rehab podcast and welcome, Emilio. Welcome, Emilio Pacheca, to the new format, new rebranded podcast called How I Rehab. You are the first guest with us. Uh, so it's a privilege to have you and welcome aboard. Thanks after uh, 10 years that I finally got an invite to participate again in Sports Map. Thrilled. Well, yes, it's uh, you've been asking to come on this podcast for a long time and uh, consistently asking uh, to present at events and we'll um, maybe touch on soon a little bit of your background in the Sports Map and how you and I uh, met many years ago, but uh, why don't you kick us off and tell us a little bit about um, obviously where you're working now at the New England Patriots and uh, I guess how you your journey to uh, working there. Yeah, so I've been over in the US for just over four years now. Uh, came over for the 2019 season, uh, saw the end of that, then kind of got disrupted by COVID as everyone did around the place and, and back for the 2020 COVID season and, and the last three have been a little bit more consistent. So you yeah, had previously done stints in the AFL and rugby, you know, worked with the AIS for the London Olympics. And I thought the opportunity came up to come over to the US, uh, try something a little bit different, experience something outside of the comfort zone. And uh, yeah, the family and I moved over and thoroughly enjoyed it over the last you know four and a bit years, four and a half years. Uh, so you uh, you glossed over a lot of your past experiences there, and, and you started at uh, you were at the Western Force for a number of years, and then moved to Carlton in the AFL. What were some of your best experiences and learnings and takeaways from that experience uh, as a head physio in uh, Australian rules football? Yeah, obviously grew up playing uh, AFL Aussie rules, and that's the game that I knew knew the the most. Transitioned over to rugby after a stint in the Waffle with the the mighty Perth Demons. Uh, I know you're a big fan of them, Nick. And I suppose the rugby was taking the knowledge from a game that I knew intimately growing up as a kid and then trying to apply that knowledge into a different sport. Working at the AIS, one of the greatest things there leading into the London Olympics was getting to work with you know sailing athletes, boxing, rowing, cycling, and working with coaches, athletes, and, and medical staff that were really experienced in those sports. So you had to kind of get in, learn about the sport, learn about the demands of the athlete, apply your knowledge of injury and rehab and management and experience, and then customize that to that particular athlete. So moving from from Aussie rules to rugby um, was a reasonably easier transition after having done that so much at the AIS, but then you start dealing with a lot of different body types. Uh, you know, the rugby prop is is very different to your football midfielder in terms of their size and, and demands. And then moving back to AFL was, you know, going to probably the elite pinnacle of, of sport uh, in Australia and resource-wise and uh, the quality of athletes, the coaching staff, um, you know, once again was, was very different to the rugby. So adapting to that. And then I suppose the transition over to NFL, it goes up a notch again in terms of uh, amount of players on the on the roster and then the different types of, of bodies that you have. Um, you know, in, in AFL, you've got the Ruckman and, and the, the on-baller midfielder, uh, very, very different body types. And then in 
in the NFL, you've got everything in between and then the bigger guys are even bigger and, you know, the smaller, faster guys are even faster. So it's it's been enjoyable, like I said, try to use your knowledge and experience and learn a new game, which, which I knew a little bit about but not a lot, and, and work with really experienced coaches, athletes, practitioners to, to take their management to the next level. Yeah, nice. And we'll touch a little bit on later around, I guess, how your rehab may differ for those different athletes and different players in the NFL. We're going to mainly talk to, I guess, some, some lower limb tendinopathy and if we, and if we can cover off a, a bit around some um, hamstring or, or knee work. But, um, mate, I know a lot of people sort of are more interested at times in the, in the pathway to, say, working in the NFL. Can you give us a bit of a snapshot on, like, I guess, what are the requirements now? So let's say put yourself in, in a position a few years ago, you're in Australia. Um, what are those, what's the sort of pathway I need to do to, to start working over there? Yeah, it was a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. I, I had some colleagues that I knew of that had worked over in the US and they were really, really helpful in guiding me uh, through the process. So you know, initially when the opportunity came up, it was, you know, through um, doing some PD over in the US and, and made a few connections here and there was you know the potential to, to come over and and work in the US so the visa side of things was was quite simple so Australians are eligible to work in the US under an E3 visa uh, which which goes for two years and is basically just a matter of renewing it every two years the work has to organize all the sponsorship but that's relatively straightforward. The physio registration process was a bit of a nightmare and, and I heard it was bad and it was even worse than what I anticipated it being. So essentially you've got to you know, dig up all your course curriculum transcripts from your undergrad and, and postgrad and submit them to this, this um, board called the FCCPT. The FCCPT then take around six months to go through each of the units that you've studied and find any gaps in your education versus the requirements of the FCCPT. So I went straight from high school into your Bachelor of, of you know, Undergrad Physio, worked for three, four years, came back, did my Masters. So all my study had been specific to Physio. So whilst I had more than enough credits in Physio-specific units and clinical education hours were five or six times the requirement, I didn't have enough general education units. So in the US, generally their first year is a very broad, um, broad year before they go into the specifics. So I had to do units on college level mathematics, um, geography, history, economics, basically anything that wasn't science related because I didn't have enough um, general education at tertiary level. Also, because I did physics at high school, I got the bridging exemption. I had to go back and do a an, an, you know, physics online course. So some of these were just... Um, you study for an exam and you can do a CLEP exam, whereas you know, physics, chemistry uh, and Italian, uh, I took that as a unit as well. They were actually all online courses through university, which took a full semester to do. So after completing all my general education units, I submitted those results a few months later, got approval to re apply to sit the national registration exam, which is run by the FSBPT, which is a separate organisation. And this is an exam, I think it was 400 odd multi-choice questions on all elements of physio. So neuro, peds, cardiothoracic, all these things that I hadn't studied in over 20 years. So I had to, had to prepare for that exam again, um, sat that, they only do them every three months, so I have to wait for that, sit that examination and then uh, eventually passed and a few months later they posted my results and finally I had to apply for my state, uh, so the state of Massachusetts to register as a, as a physio there. So all that process uh, probably took about a year and, and it is tough to do it any quicker than that, I think. Okay. Well, I hope it's worth it. Uh, can you uh, fill us in, before we talk to some injuries, fill us in a little bit around... Um, the day-to-day workings within the NFL. I know um, 
might sound pretty general and there's a lot to it, but I guess how does a, a, a typical main training day sort of work and your involvements within that? Um, and then, you know, a little bit of what, what game day sort of looks like and, and the vibes around that. Yeah, so, I mean, the first thing that was probably the hardest to get my head around was the size of the squad. Um, so we're dealing with a, a match day squad of 53 plus a practice squad of, of around about 15 or 16 players, plus your injured reserves are on top of that. Um, so, you know, at any one time we're dealing with a squad of up to 80 players. I think this year we had 140 players come through on the list. So, so then there was another 60 that came in and out of the program. So you're dealing with a, a lot of people. Um, contracts aren't guaranteed and players can be traded pretty much any time. So I remember my second week there, I was working with a guy we were doing, we were on the Nord board. He was, you know, doing his second set of Nords, a guy from you know, front office, the scouting team comes in and asked to see the player and he, the player got up and said, Oh, see you later. Thanks for working with me. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And he goes, Oh, um, I think I'm out of here. I'm like, what? Like we haven't even finished finished the last set and he came back in like 20 minutes later and said yeah I'm off I'm off to another team and essentially went straight to the airport they packed up his locker in boxes and sent it and and they had removalists come into his apartment pack up his stuff and send it on to the next place and and this guy was just completely unfazed about it I'm, I'm like couldn't believe what was going on right now so there's that element was really really different um, for me in in the NFL and in the AFL, you develop really good relationships um, with players and staff. And as you spend more time there, those relationships become really important in, in building trust. In the NFL, the, the, because contracts aren't guaranteed and because they can be traded at any time, players don't always trust you um, working you know, for the team and or, or working for the NFL. So uh, there was some hurdles to overcome in, in that regard trying to to earn the players trust and and then by the time you earn it they get traded or they're off to the next team so there's there was a large you know transition of of players so that was certainly two very very different things for me to get my head around um when when i first started there uh in terms of what what the week looks like there's a lot of meetings um it's it's a very technical game they're doing a lot of strategy a lot of set plays so that will change week to week depending on opponent as well. So, so the guys are in yep, so many meetings all throughout the day. Um, so there's a lot of downtime between being able to treat players. Sometimes you don't know when they're coming out. Meeting might run longer. Practice goes for two, three hours on field. Uh, they generally you know, take Monday, Tuesday to recover because it's such a physical game with all the bumps and bruises they're getting. They can't do much until later on in the week. So then they're... They're on feet Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, a little bit of a walkthrough, et cetera, on, on Saturday and then play on the Sunday. So the method of training is very different to AFL where you kind of dose your, your high speed running uh, throughout the week a little bit more effectively than what you can in NFL because you only have so many days to prepare um, for the game uh, after they've recovered from, from the previous Sunday. Uh, so that's interesting in the working week. They do a lot of meetings, a lot of prep, um, and then then game day. Uh, we're discussing, I was uh, over doing some PD in Europe a few weeks ago, and discussing you know the difference in a soccer game to AFL um, and NBA slash slash NFL. So the the US love the theatrics. You know, there's cheerleaders and rock music and fireworks and guns going off and blasting and flyovers by aeroplanes. So there's a lot of distractions, um, which which the players tend to get used to, I think, coming through the college system. Uh, they're accustomed to it by the time they get to NFL. But there's a lot of fanfare and hoo-ha and, and media um, surrounding everything that they do, whereas, um, you know, soccer in the, the EPL and, and European leagues that the crowd will chant and the crowd will sing and the crowd are creating a lot of the atmosphere. Uh, and, and Australia's generally pretty quiet. We're joking that the only time you hear uh, the Aussies um, 
is to yell out at the umpire or the ref to, to abuse him <laughs> um, or, or yell out, you know, ball uh, to, to yeah. kind of highlight to the, to the umps that they should be making a call or not. So there's, there's a lot of, mm. uh, yeah, it's very, very different match day compared to, to the AFL. Uh, okay. Um, and, uh, well, why don't we just briefly touch on, obviously you just mentioned you went to Europe and I think uh, some of the learning and, um, continued development, something is that you've always continued on, um, about trying to improve your work and what you do. You were over with one of the teams in the UK, and, and um, what you sort of take away from there, or, or the uh, over in Europe? Sorry, not the UK. Um, yeah, so yeah, spent a, a bit of time in continental Europe and and over in the UK as well with a couple of soccer teams over there, just doing some PD. And I think um, one thing I've been guilty of, and and I think certain. Um, sporting organisations can be guilty of his groupthink. So you end up copying what everyone else is doing and, and you have a player with an unusual injuries, injury, you ring up your colleagues, generally they are, for example, within the AFL, hey, have you seen this injury before? Um, with, with bone stress injury, for example, the, the AFL had a really good group and, and everyone tends to do similar things and then you speak to the rugby guys and they tend to manage things slightly differently and then again, within the US, the, the management's different again. So I kind of wanted to get outside um, of, of the US. I was back in Australia, obviously, last year, speak regularly with, with Australian colleagues and um, took the opportunity to, to head over to Europe and um, just, you know, discuss um, hamstring management, tendon loading protocols in soccer and, and get some ideas of how we can modify that to tailor towards you know our athletes because the demands are, are very very different but i uh, didn't want to kind of get sucked too much into to the american way of thinking and, and the nfl way of thinking wanted to broaden my horizons and um head over there and and start thinking and have come back and now on on the back of those trips we're doing you know reviews internally and and within our staff we've we've got guys that have worked for 20 years in the NFL, um, 20 years in the NBA uh, and and everything in between as well. So uh, there's a lot of different experience there, which we kind of try to put together um, and, and formulate an evidence-based program on everyone's experience and, and try to continuously innovate and improve that each year. Uh, so, yeah, that was, that was good to... Uh, head over oh, there. Uh, I'm sure, yeah, always good to spark a, a new bit of interest and motivation um, to, to keep pushing along and getting better, mate. So that's good to good to see in here. Around tendons, so if we're talking uh, tendopathy uh, and if we use, say, an Achilles, for example, because I know there's been some bit of publicity around the Achilles, well, ruptures predominantly in the NFL. Um, do you want to sort of talk through some of the early strategies we might use with, uh, say, an Achilles tendon, for example, and, and how that, uh, I guess, might differ in the context of what you guys have and can do over there. Yeah, it's we've had one to two uh, Achilles or patella tendon ruptures the last few years since I've been there. Um, we actually had two um, biceps brachii uh, ruptures this year, which, which was the first time I've come across those um, types of injuries and and consulted with a few few guys in rugby in Ireland helped out on, on working through those injuries but looking through the stats they recently recently published a few articles in the US that 30 percent of Achilles ruptures in NFL and NBA don't return to professional sport and in patella tendon ruptures 43 percent um, fail to return to to the highest level of competition so we kind of delved into this and and asked the question why and i think a lot of it comes back to that they're not guaranteed contracts so if it's a fringe player that gets injured they probably get cut and and they end up on the streets trying to do rehab with whoever they're doing it with and um struggle to get back from that uh, some of it is the protocol there there are some surgical protocols that have a long period of immobilization so is that pot potentially contributing to the fact that they're struggling to get get back to that 
optimal level um you know recovery from these can take you know a year and even two years to get full power and strength back so in in some sports maybe you can get away at 90 percent of force production whereas you know these guys are so powerful and and if it's an offensive lineman you know this weighs 150 kilos and they got to explode off off one step to block you know 250 guy, kilo guys come in the opposite direction you know five percent five percent loss in strength is probably significant trying to do that job whereas maybe in afl you can you can get away with being within 10 percent of of your previous ability so there are all questions that that we kind of asked uh you know re review our protocols and what we're doing uh as well in terms of managing tendinopathy uh as as well as dealing with with the other side of ruptures um, one, uh, we touched on it before I talked about developing trust of the athlete and, and certain players are coming into the NFL with, with beliefs and opinions from, you know, their previous um, injuries or, or dealing with previous people. So at high school level and college level, there's still a lot of modalities, there's still a lot of electrotherapy being used. So, you know, I'll have guys coming in and, uh, yeah, I've had sore knees, all throughout college, I was advised um, to stop loading, to rest them, to do Normatex uh, and, and let it rest. And then we've been doing laser and Hivermat and interferential and, and I need the shockwave. Without shockwave, I can't, I can't get out there on the field. And, and um, they're, they're ingrained beliefs throughout high school and college. And I suppose if we look at the evidence now, they're probably not highly... Uh, high on the efficacy or the list of, of modalities um, that we would use to manage tendons. So it's trying to re-educate them. Okay, rest is probably one of the worst things that you can do with, with chronic tendon and, and overcoming those ingrained beliefs. Some some people are like, yep, okay, cool, happy to roll with it. Others are like, no, 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 no. Like my doctor that's looked after me from high school said that I can't squat, um, I can't do any loading, I've just got to rest it. So... That's difficult to overcome um, and I suppose now that we've been there a few years and introduced loading programs and players have had reasonable success with with improving their, their chronic tendon management, we can kind of say, okay, don't believe me, it's all right, go speak to a few of the guys in the locker room, have a chat with them, they had something similar to you, ask what they've done and I've found that that's really helped in in getting the player engagement and player buy-in uh, in terms of you know managing managing these you know tendon issues that they've had for considerable amount of years yeah no i think that's it you've worked out really nicely um obviously a really important one to win the players over and you talked around the loading protocol um that you guys sort of implemented give us a bit of an overview of that um and you know what they might be doing across the week if, if you're dealing with say if we use achilles tendon as an example and i know some listeners will be well up to speed but give us an idea on what that might look and and then also the second part of that question is how that might differ in the afl setting you talked around the structure in the week it's quite difficult with all the meetings and things um how does that look for us yeah i'll jump back a step as well so um we've we've finished now the super bowl's on sunday and and we we're not participating, unfortunately, this week. So we've been finished for a couple of weeks now. The next time the players are required to attend is is mid-April. So essentially most teams lose them for, for three months. Um, the players uh, don't live uh, necessarily where where the team plays. Those with you know kids may in school may live in the area, but the majority of our players take off to warmer parts of the country, i.e. California, Texas, Florida, um, Arizona, or, or back where they're from originally. So in the NFL, you, you lose them for three months. They come back and it's, it's not mandatory. So there's all this talk over what's mandatory and what's not mandatory. So they come back for off-season program, which is non-mandatory. So it goes through a phase of, of two weeks with the strength and conditioning coaches. So we starting running, lifting, um, two weeks with some low level coaching and then two weeks with, with a little bit more higher intensity coaching, finishing with mini camp 
which is three days um, mandatory um, involvement. Then they they break again um, and they go back to wherever they're from and return again for training camp. So training camp is about 12 days um, leading into our first practice game. So they come back. Some are in really good condition, some are not in good condition. Some have trained with some really good people. Some have, have trained with some guy that they found on Instagram and paid an awful lot of money to go do you know, footwork and agility uh, drills that, that look great on Instagram and, and fantastic and, and they've paid you know tens of thousands of dollars to work on their speed, but they haven't done any high-speed running. So all of a sudden... We're going to go back and and in training camp most teams will will you know go five or six days in a row on feet. Um, there's extended squad, so you probably got ninety players at this this point in time, and it will cut down to the fifty three plus the practice squad. So everyone's trying out for a spot. So if a guy's got a bit of a tight calf, he's you're like, well, we might have to modify you today, and and he's like, well, if you modify me, you know. The coach is going to cut me, so no, I'm just I'm just going to go out, and you're trying to educate them that that it's not necessarily like that. But previously, they've been cut by teams because they had a tight calf and and came out of a practice and they were cut the next day, or or that happened to their friend, and and they've got all these horror stories which are, which are true. So I kind of understand where they're coming from. So you're trying to get them through this this really intense period. Um, some sometimes they've had the mistake of you know my, they just got through off season program and then they rested for five weeks and their knees are feeling great and they come back in and they they're five days on feet in a row and and yeah they wake up in the morning and they can barely walk and you can't deload them because if you deload them they're going to potentially get cut um, so it it's really really tricky and and that's where you know I've engaged with a lot of international experts from around the world to to help pick their brains on, on trying to solve this problem. So in answer to your question, there is no real um, loading strategy that we do as a whole. It's very individual case-by-case case basis. Whereas I think because AFL, you know, they get three weeks off over Christmas now and everyone's having kittens that the players are away for three weeks over Christmas and um, they've only got two months before the first preseason game, and I'm like, well, we we barely see these guys for five months, and then we've got twelve days to get them ready for the first preseason game. So, AFL was pretty easy in in being able to implement some global programs. So, this comes along ed around educating the players, and because they scatter, we'll we'll go off and visit them. So we might be flying at one, one guy will go out to California and visit a couple of players out there, um, you know, one down to Texas and visit a few players there. And that that's, was we, we took from the NBA. The NBA is really good at doing that. And it's easy when there's only 15 players on your list in NBA and a couple of superstars, um, you know, they can really get that 12-month-a-year you know, service um for us is a little bit harder with the bigger lists and and just the amount of transition of guys coming in and out of the program so um i think a normal week they'll play on the sunday uh monday we'll just get them to do some some recovery type work either on legs or or off legs and probably more your, your lower level isometric work on on those days and tuesday most teams will generally have a day off um so you can either do some more strength work or or isometrics again, depending on on how sore they are post game. Then they've got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So we, we're trying to pick one or two of the days to do do the high level loading, um, and probably if they can tolerate that, marry that up with the highest day on field. Um, so we're we're just getting a little bit of undulation. On that, but there's a lot of monotony in training, and and most teams in the AF, in the NFL will practice Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, very very similar type practices. So it's it's really hard to get that three day loading cycle of low moderate and high intensity uh, activity into the tendons. So a lot of it's chasing our tail. If once we get in season, um, trying to find what works best for for that player finding that routine, sticking to it, and then 
in the off season really spend that five months getting them on a, a more regular loading cycle of you know your, your low level isometrics your heavy strength work and then your ballistic um, and plyometric work on that third day and rotating through that that cycle as well okay i'm going to try to nail you down on a couple of um specifics around some of those numbers and metrics uh, but i guess first around just your isometric loading that you're using currently and we'll stick with an achilles tendon as just an example can you give us a an idea on what that might look like as in for those guys let's talk a prop uh or, or a linebacker whatever they're called uh and then uh so what sort of heavy loading are we doing and how heavy is that in time likewise also for um you mentioned your heavy loading day that might be in line with when their bigger field session is what's that look like for us is that my uh, heavier standing calf raise um some seated work what do you, what do you actually do Yeah, so uh, positionally very different. So yeah, the the rugby front row, the rugby prop is very different to your your winger. Um, NFL is probably like that, but exacerbated. So so your um, linemen, which can be offense or defensive linemen, are generally the heavier guys, you know, 140, 150 kilos. They have three or four seconds of explosive activity. Um, so as we know with our GPS and and certainly when there's contact involved as well, the the acceleration and deceler, de, deceleration algorithms on GPS um, can get blurred by contact. So so we do a rep count of them and, and trying to build them up and, and make sure that they're prepared for that rep count. And and there is no low load on field for them. It's, it's every time they take a snap, it's a high level explosion. So with those front rollers, a lot of the things that we're doing um, off the field are long um, time under tension. So, you know, the, the Ebony Rio, Jill Cook model of, you know, your five sets of 45 second holds, which, which will help with some of the pain associated um, with, a, with a painful tendon. Uh, then we'll do slow, heavy strength work as well. Um, so a combination of seated and standing bilateral unilateral and and get them heavy you know five sets of three really slow eccentric focus uh we did have a a couple of cases that were just struggling um with with regular loading patterns so um had a, had a chat with scott morrison who published a paper uh, reasonably recently with jill around um what, what we've termed cluster sets. So, you know, three to eight second hold, looking for anywhere between a minute to two minutes total time under tension. So there, is, there are some players that will will do their um, low level isometrics for the longer hold of 45 seconds duration. Then they'll have their, their strength day and then we'll intertwine the cluster sets where they're doing anywhere between a three and eight second hold um, for, for a total time under tension of, of around about a minute and then building that up. And we'll try to sprinkle that in once to twice a week as well. So it, it's a lot of trial and error with these guys. Um, obviously, the ones with a tenosynovitis or, or plantaris friction syndrome will manage differently to those with the mid-substance Achilles. Uh, the, the NFL love uh, hills and you know, hill training. So... It's an idea of um, in in pre-season, those with an enthesopathy that we try to keep them off the hill and substitute that with with other um, activities as well because it's important that they're still working, that they're not just sitting and watching. they got to be working as well. So uh, uh, we've we put stair work into a lot of them um, where they're not going into that dorsiflexion of the hill, so they'll go, you know, be running upstairs and, and flights of stairs instead. Uh, sled work's an interesting one um, that the front rollers do a lot of sled work as part of their training. So it's encouraging them to make sure that they're doing sleds in the off season because it's hard to load up a sled with 400 kilos of weight at your local gym or training facility and find turf or are you doing resisted running. So I think making sure that they're training the off season to prepare them for what they're required to do um, 
whether it's hill running or sleds is, is really important. So you're not just getting this acute spike um, in, in a type of activity that they're not used to. Um, so that, they're the big guys. The, the receivers, are, they're the Ferraris rather than the, the Mack truck. So these guys run and they run fast. Like uh, I remember my first rehab session that I was, I was sitting in on was with one of the defensive backs and, and he started warming up and he was doing like 50 yards, 60 yards striders. I'm like, whoa, like he's, he's, I said to warm up and he's going flat out and then realized that was a warm up. Like his, his flat out was fast and, and he ran 400 meter at college. And I think he would probably qualify for the Australian Olympic team in 400 meters. Uh, he's, he's that good a runner. And then all these guys that are super fast have, have run track at high school or even college. So they are, they are machines in terms of pumping out high speed, volume and and day to day like consecutive days like you know, in afl would give them a high high speed day and would probably want them to recover a little bit the next day whereas these guys are running you know 95 percent of their max multiple times consecutive days in a row like four to five times a week um and and it's not uncommon now and, and this is you know public data that you can kind of see through the nfl that the players are running in excess of 90% of their, their max speed, you know, up to a hundred times a week. And, and in AFL, it was, we were saying, Oh, let's get them to do it two or three times every 10 days. Uh, whereas, whereas these guys are pump, pumping it out. But I think that comes from having being habituated to it over you know, a 10 year period through throughout high school and college. And um, not to jump ship away from, I've got a couple of things around the Achilles still to touch on, but uh, from a hamstring point of view, um, obviously, yeah, we, we dose the speed from a protective element for, for hamstrings and there's probably nothing more protective than repetitive doses like that. Are we, do you see hamstring issues within those guys very commonly? Are you finding maybe that there's too much there or is it the fact that they're just so well prepared, they're, they're quite robust? Yeah, I think people coming new into our program are, are probably the biggest risk that we identify. The ones that are in the program and they're they're doing it are fine. It's it's when they come into a program that hasn't necessarily done the high speed running that we do, or they've had a break and they've gone and trained with this new guy off Instagram and they've spent all off season doing footwork and ladder drills and haven't done any high speed running. Um, when if they come back, we're, we're like, okay, we're going to have to probably dose this uh, a little bit more sensibly to to get you back into it. But it blows my mind, like looking at the GPS when I first started and I would have said that it was impossible for guys to, to pump out those numbers with, with my experience in, in AFL and, and NFL, but they've, they've trained it for a long time and, and they seem that they're habituated to it and, and can tolerate it as long as it's consistent. It's, it's, um, you know, as we've seen in AFL, if, if they, if you have a condensed period of games with short turnarounds and focus a lot on recovery, and this was something we spoke about in soccer too, playing playing on a Sunday and a Wednesday and then backing up on a Saturday with domestic leagues, Champions League. Um, you can experience detraining because you focus so much on recovering between games that you're not getting that regular eccentric exposure, be it through Nordics or whatever other eccentric hamstring work that you're doing reintroducing that eccentric work can become dangerous as well. So you, know, you go through this period of a few weeks where where they stop doing it because they have a busy schedule, then the schedule lightens off, they reintroduce eccentric work and then you know there's there's risk there, mm-hmm. an increased risk there of players sustaining soft tissue injury as they reintroduce that activity in season. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, I guess touching on loading outside of the field and I'll use, let's say those guys who do uh, hit high volumes of high speed regularly. And there's obviously a, a lot of sort of public publicity around the increased hamstrings in the EPL currently um, for that, for that player we're talking around with a, who, uh, who does a lot of high speed running, how, how are they doing hamstring loading? Is it that important for them? Is it almost less important because they're getting that exposure or are you, uh, still get able to get really good uh, loading, whether it's a uh, eccentric, isometric, what have you, throughout the week, and um, and if so, what does that exercise look like? Yeah, um, I think 
it's it's a really interesting conversation and conversations I've been having with with quite a few people uh, in in the soccer and within the US and and got a chat with another guy um, back in AFL in Australia tomorrow and and at the, at the moment I think a lot of us sit in the middle and it's like well let's let's give them all of it let's give them isometric loading let's give them eccentrics and and let's expose them to the the high speed running. Uh, there, there are several people that have the school of thought that you could, you know, what happens if you take out the eccentric work and are they getting enough just from high speed running? Um, I, I think everyone would now would probably support the concept that if we just do eccentrics without the high speed running, you're probably going to run into trouble. Uh, whereas there's a few people saying, you, you know, how, how much eccentric straining is is necessary to to give the players you know, protection against soft tissue injury and years ago um you know, christian thorberg came out and presented to the afl physios and um he was bewildered that we didn't do his his program uh of, of nordics which was shown to work and some of the counter argument was we're not just doing Nordics, you know, we might co do complementary exercises of, of RDLs, of kettlebell swings, um, you know, Bourne published all the, the AMG activity of all the different types of hamstring exercises and, and showed us that we can have a variety of, of exercises that target the hamstrings. And, and I think there's not really, to answer your question, I don't think there's great consensus around one versus the other and everyone's kind of doing a little bit of everything because you you don't want it to fail and it would be interesting if, if a team just cut out all eccentric training and just did high speed running would would that change their soft tissue injury results a lot of people think that it won't um, but no one that i've met has has actually done it yet it's all all theoretical um so we we still, uh, as a group at the moment, and, and again, we're having discussions over this. Um, my personal opinion is is that we want to expose them to a combination of eccentric, eccentric and high-speed running activity. Um, we want a variety of exercises that are going to target medial lateral hamstring, hip dominant, knee dominant. Um, but we, we're focusing on, on the core exercise and, you know, the big rocks, um, to me, and, and speaking to a lot of strength coaches around around the world, um, if if you don't have a lot of time and you want to get your big rocks in, you know, your squat and your Nordic, uh, you're probably two go tos for lower for lower limb, and then a calf based exercise as well, and then adding in Copenhagen's for your for your adductors. If if you're looking at four core exercises that you're going to get most bang for your buck my thoughts would be those are the four if if you need to substitute for whatever reason then then you can um and then around that building a whole you know list of complementary exercises as well yeah okay and so yeah i guess um if a guy was sprinting a lot though the, the challenge there and uh is, is to get when to get those loading parameters in and and do you find i guess on experience with those athletes are they willing to lift heavy are they willing to get in the gym and lift is the lifting culture there quite uh impressive in that sense around their hamstrings or are they you know a little bit more apprehensive um you know based on their history and you talked around the the passive modalities earlier yeah, certainly how do they go the with that? lifting culture in nfl and rugby is very very different to soccer um speaking you know with the soccer teams over in europe they the players aren't bought into lifting whereas nfl and and rugby especially is just part of the culture and i think afl's um the majority you know you were testified to this the majority of players are, are bought into lifting but you might get the odd odd few that are kind of against against having lifting uh, i remember you know back at in, when i was working in rugby uh, the coach would say well if you can't squat you can't get in a scrum because if you can't put 240 kilos on the bar going through your spine, how are you going to put that vertical compressive force through into the the front rollers of the the other side of the scrum? So every single you know player returned to squatting um, after you know microdiscectomy, lumbar disc 
you know, herniation, every single player returned. And that really blew me away coming from, you know, the waffle and, and certainly the AFL background. It was like, oh, squats are dangerous, squats are bad on your back. And oh, if you had a disc injury, you can't squat again. And and then going into rugby and seeing them all return changed my perception on that. Um, and I think if you if you work with a really good strength coach or, or really good physio and, and clean up the technique and get them doing it safely and progress it smartly, um, you know, they'll they'll return to it. So a lot of the guys in NFL will squat or deadlift. Um, similarly with rugby, a lot of them are squatting, whereas so, so they're used to lifting. And then when you put in, in eccentric hamstring training as well, they understand what DOMS is. Uh, I don't want to generalise, but I think, you know, soccer players can sometimes misinterpret DOMS and, and, and athletes can become scared of DOMS, that they don't want to feel tight or sore in their hamstrings. They think they're going to injure them and, and trying to work through that DOMS, especially if they're not consistent with their training, can be a real issue. So does, does a role to play of more isometric training, progressing onto your eccentric work? Uh, how do you periodise that? It's probably more difficult, um, I think, more of a challenge in the soccer teams from from speaking to colleagues over there working working in that industry. The other one is is when do you put it? Do you put it? You know your heavy eccentric loading um, after your main session of the week where they've already done their high speed running. Do you do it on their off day, um, the day before? Do you do it before they practice? Do they do it after they practice? I'd always liked doing it after the main session i'd think okay they've they've got their most dangerous session out of the way let's really load them eccentrically and heavy after that session generally they got 72 hours from the game um and and that's just the way that everyone seemed to do it and and where we really challenge ourselves at the moment is why do we do what we do like, can you do it differently? Is that group think or is there evidence to support that? And I really don't think there's any evidence to suggest that that needs to be done that way. Speaking to people at other teams, they, and especially in college football as well, they have four lifts to do during the week and the players actually choose what day they want to do those lifts. So some might, might lift Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday. Some might lift Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Some might lift before practice, some might lift after practice. And the, again, I haven't found any evidence to support this. And if anyone listening out there has anything or any research or projects on the go with this, please hit up Nick and, and forward the details on to me. Um, because there are colleges out there doing heavy eccentric hamstring training and Nordics pre-practice and not having any issues with it. There are, there are teams out there doing it the day before their main practice of the week. So if Tuesday's their off day, they'll do their heavy eccentric lift on a Tuesday and then practice Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And they don't appear to be having any any issues, which you know really leads me to question why I had that thought that it needed to be done afterwards. So Very philosophical. You know, I haven't come across any evidence to support yeah. any philosophy. Um, did you have anything to add on that? Am I missing something here? Have I oh, I don't think, I don't think you're missing anything. Uh, you've covered just about everything there. But uh, no, I like it. This is not um, a podcast about me, mate. So my opinion is not put forward too often. Uh, but right. I'm enjoying your, your input. So... <laughs> any of the listeners out there, please send through some information that I haven't seen or, or um, no. let Nick know and then you can join him on the next podcast and, and educate okay, me. Guys. Definitely, definitely jump in open to anyone reaching out. That's for sure. Now, I'm going to be punchy for this uh, last little part, mate, because I want to cover off and I'm wary that we've gone uh, forward and back a little bit from some hamstring stuff, um, just gone off the cuff and impromptu, but there's no other way with, with you. So, But I really wanted to go bang, two things on the Achilles. I'm like, at least one, give me a, uh, a measure around what load you're looking for for a linebacker when they're doing their calf loading or like a metric around your testing you're using to quantify their strength. So an example there might be someone who had the Achilles or an Achilles rupture. How are you quantifying their level of strength? Are you using a, a force plate um, or are you just using your load on the Smith machine or are you using yeah an endurance measure? Uh, yeah, I can't give you a good answer on this because I'm still trying to develop uh, our protocol and, and we're trying a lot of different things. I, I love the force plates. I, I think, you know, 
using force plates because there's some really good measurements on um, you know, rate of force development, power, et cetera, and, and these guys are powerful athletes, so we need to measure that well. Um, that said, we also want to see the endurance and the capacity in there too. So uh, our exit criteria that we're kind of using uh, will will look at all three aspects of in, endurance, strength, and power. Uh, our in, endurance, we're building up um, a, a lot of stair work in, in our calf, foot, and Achilles injuries. So the endurance work will be done on the stairs. Like fortunately, we have a stadium with 380 stairs from from bottom to top, so we can we can get them doing, you know, up to 10 reps of that um, in in a session. We've got elevators that will take us back down if we just want to focus on the concentric uh, component of that or the concentric isometric component of that. Uh, using the metronome uh, was advice. These are all ideas I'm stealing from other people. I, uh, I didn't come up with any of these myself, but but they're out there. Um, using the metronome to increase from you know 80 beats per minute up to 180 beats per minute uh, in, in running up the stairs has has been something that I've incorporated into the endurance side of things. Uh, sleds, uh, we do a lot of sled work, so we're wanting to see them push, you know, certain amounts, you know, say two times body weight on the sled for 15 yards you know repeated 10 reps so that there are functional endurance um, competencies that we want to see developed we we're wanting to see their um, jump data drop jump data returning to normal on the force plates uh, there's a lot of really good work done being done with british athletics at the moment on you know the seated calf raise and doing an isometric test with the force plate uh, that's recently been published and and i think that's we're playing around with it. There's still a bit of refinement that I think needs to be done for that to become a really, really reliable test, uh, but giving us some good good data in their rate of force development and then isometric peak force, normal, normalising for body weight. Um, and then, you know, your, your standard Smith machine or, or seated calf raise or standing calf raise, uh, looking at a proportion of body weight, be it, you know, two and a half, three times body weight, um, as a, as a three RM, uh, are probably the ones out there that I've come across at the moment that we're working with. Uh, so that's uh, two and a half. A no, no, that was pretty good for, for you. Uh, two and a half to three times body weight for standing Smith machine at, at three reps, or is that seated? It's, it's either way. That's uh, pretty solid. Yeah, so it'll vary on on the weight. So speaking with the British athletic guys, they. Their athletes weigh about seven, you know, 60, 70 kilos, and so three times body weight is is one hundred and eighty kilos. When I've got a guy that weighs one hundred and fifty kilos, three times body weight is four hundred and fifty kilos. Now, a guy's not going to be doing four hundred and fifty kilos. So, uh, we, we're still there's some really good normative data produced by the British athletic guys around people that weigh 70, 80 kilos. Um, we're just lacking in in really refined numbers of of guys above a hundred kilos because the the weights just start getting enormous. And then you know, the the ballet, um, you know, Sue Mays, who's who's a you know common presenter on Sports Map, has helped me out a lot as well. But we can't really compare a fifty year old ballerina to a hundred and fifty kilo front rower um, in in terms of normalising for body weight. Uh, so, so I think that's specific to your sport, and and we just haven't had enough players through at the moment for me to give you. A, you know, it needs to be one point eight times body weight for anyone above one hundred and forty kilos, or it needs to be two point two times body weight for anyone one hundred and twenty to one hundred and forty kilos. We're working towards those sorts of numbers and and parameters and guidelines, but I, just looking at the the data, I think that's where it's going to sit. The the heavier they are, obviously, the less. Um, multiple of body weight um, that you can be you know, requiring them to achieve because, you know, they're not going it's, to, it's physiologically impossible, I yeah. think, to do 450 kilos. Uh, spot on. I think that's where, yeah, the complexities in working with the different athletes that you have there, then obviously um, a good old standard throwaway line of two times body weight might not necess necessarily apply when, say, in AFL, you could almost apply that across the group bar and maybe a couple of athletes. Um, Mate, brilliant. Um, who's, who will win the Super Bowl next week? We've got an NFL physio on here. We may, we better quickly chat around some NFL for those fans out there. Yeah, um, 
unfortunately, I don't really care because you know, I'm just bitter and filthy that, that I'm not there. Uh, I thought you were going to ask me this question. So, you know, we've got to say Mitch Wisnowski, the, the punter for the 49ers, Perth boy. Um, you know, he was down at Perth Footy Club as a Colt player when I, when I worked there. So I'd, I'd love to see Mitch win a, win a Super Bowl ring. So there you go, 49ers. So Mitch is what well, he's the punter for the 49ers. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, I didn't actually realise that. Good on him. So for those who don't know, Mids was uh, my first physio when in uh, no, not my first physio, but a physio for me when I was in the waffle, uh, dominating the waffle over there, mates. Uh, he was floated in, floated out, very blasé, um, but um, that certainly got his start there. And then um, put me into his clinic that he was managing there, and I turned it around for him from a, from a struggling local clinic to a thriving one. So he can thank me for where he is today. Um, but uh, now, mate, enough of me. And the last little part, you've had a, a fair turnaround there recently with a new coach or, or a, a changing coach. Um, how are things going to look for next year and uh, what's on the what's on the cards? Yeah, well, um, the, the organisation are, are far more experienced than me in, in winning Super Bowls. But um, unfortunately... Uh, it's it's a situation that I've experienced before. So this is my sixth coaching change um, in, in the last 20 years in sporting teams. So I'm, I'm slowly getting used to it. It's always hard, always difficult. Um, you know, the previous coach, like unbelievable guy. I think it's always easier having an assistant coach come in and take over in terms of I've, I've worked with him the last three years. So he, he's a great guy as well. And um, it's... It's going to be different, that's for sure. So we'll we'll wait and see what happens. Just as long, mate, as, the well, Blues, as long as the Blues win the Premiership this year, I'll be I'll be more than happy. So okay, so good to see. You're still tracking the Blues down at uh, you still you haven't fully lost lost yourself uh, in the bright lights of the NFL yet, and you're still keeping track of um, you know the Australian rules football going on down here, mate. So good to good to know. Um, all right, mate, is there anything we haven't covered off that you think was important to sort of, I guess, pass on to our uh, listeners uh, at SportsMap and, and some message around, um, you know, the pathway or, or, or some of those injuries? Is there anything I've missed? No, I think that was that was pretty comprehensive. Hopefully um, I've put everyone off trying to get a job over here because um, it, it was a nightmare. <laughs> but no, all jokes aside, it, it was worth it in, in the long run. Uh, had a, had a great time and great experience uh, over in the US and, and certainly very unique set of challenges that that I hadn't really thought of before I got over here and finding solutions and, and speaking to people to to um, improve processes and procedures in, in less than ideal circumstances is, is always really challenging and rewarding. Okay. All right, mate. Well, um, you were... A- you were a, a formulative part of SportsMap and, and getting together the very first event uh, for us back in Perth in pulling Anthony Hogan into to presenting for us. It probably got the, the start, and uh, ever since then you've you've asked for freebies and everything along the way. Um, but we hope to maybe get you uh, over here for a course soon uh, and and keep you involved. So, mate, I'm sure you've got plenty to deliver um, and pass on all that knowledge to practitioners. So we look forward to hearing from you again soon, mate. And uh, thanks for your time on the podcast. No worries. As long as you get Mullo involved, I'll be there. <laughs>